The 2023 Chicago White Sox were a bad baseball team, but they weren't just any bad team. They were disappointingly bad because they actually had some expectations going into the season. Not world conquering expectations necessarily, but most people looked at their roster and let out a resounding, eh, they could make the playoffs and it wouldn't surprise us all that much. They play in a weak division, separate themselves from the walking scarecrow who couldn't stop getting DUIs and had a roster bursting with untapped potential even if the previous season was a major setback. It's like being a Metallica fan in 2003. Coming off load and reload, you've accepted the fact that they are slowly immersing themselves into the pits of mediocrity. But at least there are a few standout moments to hold on to. And who knows, they could always throw you in for a surprise. But then, Saint Anger comes out, and all the hope you held on to for your favorite band ever being good again was lost. That's what the 2023 Chicago White Sox season was like. Every inkling of optimism you had vanished, replaced with the reality that this is your owner, this is your payroll, and this is your record. This team that was so close to breaking through after a lengthy rebuild, making some not you honestly savvy trades to build a solid core around and become a perennial contender. But it all fell apart. Tim Anderson, their glue guy who was supposed to be their offensive spark plug, one of the worst seasons for a shortstop this century. Yohan Moncada, who initially signaled the start of their rebuild when he was acquired as a top prospect from the Red Sox in 2016, and who signaled the end of it when they signed him to a five-year extension in 2020. One of the worst third basemen in the league, when he was even able to play. Eloy Jimenez, a player with superstar level hitting prowess who they stole from their northern rivals. Worst designated hitter in the American League, Dylan Cease, who came along with Jimenez in what should have been the coup of the century, who placed second in Cy Young voting the previous season, seventh worst ERA for a qualified starter. Lucas Giolito, yet another acquisition from one of those savvy trades who was supposed to be their three starter with potential ace upside, fourth worst ERA. Lance Lynn, their bulldog elder rotationsman who sneakily has been one of the best pitchers in the game since 2019, second worst ERA in all of Major League Baseball. Only one of these pitchers would finish their 2023 season in a White Sox uniform. I could go into a full dissection. We could discuss the Keenan Middleton comments about their lack of clubhouse leadership, their righteously angry fan base having more clarity than the front office. I've been a diehard Chicago White Sox fan for nearly 40 years. I didn't understand the Larusa hire, but I gave them the benefit of the doubt. I forgave the free agents they let go. I was befuddled by the Benintendi and Clevenger signings. Our right fielders are hitting 180 with a weighted run created plus of 28. Tens of millions of dollars on replacement level players playing 500 ball should be underachieving. Not 11 games under 500. Yes, over the hill. Benintendi, he wanted him in the draft six years ago. He's got a .1 war. Clevenger isn't just a clubhouse cancer he, and a disgusting human being. He's a horrendous pitcher. The entire organization is poisoned. Them deciding to keep Mike Clevenger on the roster despite his off-the-field domestic violence issues. Their refusal as a club to address their consistent gaping hole in right field despite it being a power position for most contending teams. Or the fact that owner Jerry Reinsdorf treats his hiring process more like take your friend to work day rather than showing any semblance of due diligence. This is a franchise that is rotten to its core. A proper autopsy would require a panel of experts, and we might accidentally end up writing Jerry Reinsdorf's biography. Honestly, I just can't subject myself to that. So I decided to do myself one worse. I'm going to watch a full White Sox game from 2023 and see firsthand what made this team so pathetic. Now, I want to be particular about the game I watch, so I set a couple of rules. First, they had to somewhat be in playoff contention, so let's give them about 5% playoff odds coming into the game. This pretty much eliminates everything after the 4th of July, as I really have no interest in watching the ghost of Tuki Toussaint get lit up by the Seattle Mariners in a sadly meaningless August game. The other rule is that it has to be a loss. That's it. They lost 62% of the games they played in, so I feel like I'd be depriving myself of the true 2023 White Sox experience had I witnessed one of their rare wins. So let's throw these parameters into the random game generator and see what we get.
June 15th against the Dodgers in Los Angeles. Grab a seat, get your antidepressants, and let's get ready to put it on the board! Yes! And watch some 2023 White Sox baseball. First off, context, context, context. The White Sox got off to their worst start since 2018. A team, mind you, whose opening day starter was 36-year-old James Shields, but they started to play well going into June. In fact, per Jay Kuda, they would be leading the AL Central if you just pretended that April didn't count. This may seem like I'm trolling, but for a team with as much potential as the White Sox, this is an encouraging revelation. Think of it like this. The 2019 Washington Nationals, a team that would go on to win that year's World Series, were farther out from a playoff spot with an older roster at this point of their season. After splitting the first two games, they have a chance to win this series on the road against the mighty Dodgers. Now, in a Game 70 of a 162 game season, it's kind of silly to say that this is a do or die matchup, but I'd like to refer to games like this as team defining. I have no way of quantifying what makes any single game worthy of defining a team's season, but you know, winning a series on the road against a juggernaut is just what good teams do. And the White Sox could arguably remake their season here after being stuck in the mud for so long. Unfortunately, they have two factors working against them. One, they're wearing their standard road uniforms. Per Jay Kuda, they have by far their worst record with their grays on at this point. Two, they are atrocious in the final game of a series going into tonight. The Royals and A's are the only AL teams with a worse record in series finales, and the less I say about those two teams, the better. I'm watching the NBC Chicago sports broadcast, which is being called by Jason Benetti and Gordon Beckham. Jason Benetti should be a household name by this point. He has called games for Peacock, ESPN, and NBC. You might recognize him for appearing on the alternate StatCast edition of the Home Run Derby, but his day job is calling games for the team he grew up rooting for, and he's beloved by the south side of Chicago, the same way Vince Scully was in Los Angeles, or Harry Carey was on the north side. Growing up with cerebral palsy, Jason had to use his wits to overcome his own body's limitations, and through his passion and fearlessness, has earned his place as one of the game's best play callers, and now, one of the only reasons to tune into a Shy Sox game. So, the first major issue this team is hitting leadoff. Tim Anderson was supposed to be the Freddie Freeman of the White Sox rebuild, a player who started his career in the trenches of it before becoming celebrated for seeing the team through to success on the other side. Yeah, he struggled to stay on the field throughout his career, but in a way he cemented himself as the spiritual leader of these Sox, endearing himself to both managers he's played with while silently having an insane start to his limited postseason career. Then came some kind of monster. I could do a deep dive into a steep drop off, but if there is any stat that sums up how far he's fallen, it would be this. Tim Anderson had barreled up more balls at this point in the 2019 season than he would in all of 2023. I believe the worst thing the White Sox could do was continuously trudge out Anderson in the leadoff spot as the season went on. In a climate where you saw superstars like Mookie Betts, Ronald Acuna Jr., and Julio Rodriguez batting leadoff, the last thing you want to do is expose a player who is clearly going through a career worst slump by putting him there. Not to pile on because personally, I love Tim Anderson and hope that he can thrive away from this rotting stump of a franchise. But his on base percentage when leading off an inning this year was 237. For context, 36 year old Juan Pierre, one of the primary leadoff hitters for the 2013 Miami Marlins, considered to be one of the worst offenses of the 21st century, had a batting average of 239 when leading off an inning. This is what led to the White Sox getting the worst production out of their 1 and 2 hitters for the entire year. In fact, 23 teams got better numbers from the bottom of their order than the White Sox did from their top. I'm already getting that pit in my stomach, and the game hasn't even started yet. All of this was to say, the first two hitters can't get the ball out of the infield, which sets things up for Luis Robert. Ah, Luis Robert. The right-handed hitter. Robert smokes this ball, left center field, Luis on two strikes, gets it up and out, and the Sox have the lead. So, who is this guy? 
Luis Lapentera Robert is who I'd argue was the secret weapon of this team, being the most sought after international free agent out of Cuba in 2017. Teams such as the Reds, Cardinals, and Padres all showed interest, but it was the White Sox who were able to lure him in. Part of their pitch was fostering a rich Cuban tradition tracing back to the days of Minnie Minoso, but the dump truck of money they threw on him as a signing bonus didn't hurt either. This was a decision that took a lot of convincing for Jerry Reinsdorf to agree to. Out of all players on this team, I would argue he was the biggest X factor in order for this championship window to work. You don't just get called the Cuban Mike Trout and not be expected to lead your team to glory. Oh no. But I guess he took the comparison too seriously as he ended up jumping straight to the injury prone part of Trout's career for his first couple of seasons. But in 2023, everything came together, with Robert posting one of the best seasons in a White Sox uniform this century. Unfortunately, it came a year too late. Next up is Aloy Jimenez, who in another dimension is the Boog Powell to Luis Robert's Frank Robinson. But now he's quickly becoming the Albert Pujols to Robert's Trout, a player who was once given the prodigious 70 power tool by scouts when he was making his way up through the minors. Like Robert, he showed he belonged in the majors whenever he was between the lines but also like Robert, he was accident prone. But man, when he got a hold of one, there just aren't many better sights in baseball. That ball's hit well. Eloy Jimenez to right field and bring him home as well. A two-run lead is just what the doctor ordered for White Sox starter Dylan Cease. Did I ever tell you all that Dylan Cease is one of my favorite pitchers to watch when he's on? One part of it is his follow through, which sees his right leg turn with a force so violent that for a split second you actually think he's going to do a full 360. But most of my enjoyment comes from watching his gyro slider, a pitch that he pretty much uses to bully the bottom left corner of the zone. One that he could throw to both lefties and righties and one that he almost single-handedly rode to a Cy Young award the previous season. Pair that with a power four-seamer, a few party tricks, and suddenly the Justin Verlander but with the slider comps don't seem that outlandish. But now, he's cursed with wearing a White Sox uniform in 2023, one that sucks out everything that once made you a good player. He comes into the game with two objectives. One, try to go six innings. Two, not let a fifth inning error against the Dodgers phase him this time. Easy. Cease recaptures his 2022 form in the first inning by striking out two all-stars with a slider that is looking dangerously close to the most valuable pitch it once was. His second inning proves the first was no fluke, and suddenly a two-run lead seems insurmountable for the Dodgers if Cease can keep pitching at this level. Tim Anderson heeds the advice of Gordon Beckham. I wanted to pull it back and try to go to the opposite field base twist tonight at 10 on NBC Chicago. So naturally, the next three hitters, honest to God, just don't know how to respond. Just for reference, in the past 30 games, Dodgers three hitter saw a runner in scoring position almost as often as a White Sox three hitter saw a runner on base in general. When a team gets on base at such a pitiful rate, hitters just don't know what to do with themselves when they see a runner on. It's like when Jerry Reinsdorf won his only World Series with them in 2005, and his response was the last thing anyone who possesses even a hint of self-awareness would say. Uh, get out and buy your Bulls tickets. Luckily for their offense though, Sees continues to eviscerate Dodgers bats, and now we get to talk about Jake Berger. Despite being born and raised in St. Louis, Berger grew up a White Sox fan from his regular visits to the South Side, idolizing their former first baseman Paul Canerco. When Berger was drafted 11th overall by them in 2017, one of the first calls he received was from Canerco himself, a moment that has stuck with him throughout these years. Berger was on the right track as he became yet another top prospect for an increasingly promising farm system, but an innocent jog to first in spring training 2018 almost ended his career. In a study conducted the year prior, Dr. Daniel Bull estimated about a 62% return rate for major league players who tear their Achilles. Decent odds that become a lot more dire if the vulnerable tendon is to re-rupture, which is what happened to Berger 10 weeks later. But here he is in 2023, the second best hitter for his childhood team, playing across the diamond from where his idol once stood. 
He has become a mental health advocate within the game, used his experience having to make up for a lost two years to help coach his teammates, and has a strong connection to this fan base. Did I mention that he also hits tanks? Epic company. Might get and another. that ball is smashed to left center field. Jay Berger. Up and over once again. We should probably also talk about their home run fit, which gives me a lot less <laughs> vibes and a little more <laughs> vibes. As there's a drive into deep left field by Vaughn, it'll be a home run, and so that'll make it a 4 nothing ball game. So the White Sox have scored all their runs on solo homers, which got me thinking, is this just a White Sox thing? I decided to plot out every major league team's total homers versus percentage of them that were solo shots in 2023. This quadrant is where you want to be. It means that your team hit a lot of homers and got at least two runs on a good bit of them. These two quadrants are aight. It means you hit a lot of homers, but most of them were solo shots, or that you didn't hit many, but at least you got the most bang for your buck. This quadrant though, this is the dirty window. This means your team didn't hit a ton of home runs and a concerning amount of them were hit with the bases empty. The White Sox obviously are in the bad quadrant, as they are for pretty much any quadrant for any plot chart or Venn diagram made for the 2023 season. Thank you, Jay Kuda. This may not seem like a big deal. Oh, whatever, you're nitpicking an oil leak when half the engine is missing. But as we'll see, even the smallest of leaks can lead to the largest of fires. So scoring four runs seems like a huge victory for a team that scored three or less in more than half the games they played. But this is where you have to tack on. They're still losing at a concerning rate when scoring four times, but throw one more run on the board and they are almost a 500 team. On top of that, they are facing a spot starter with their perceived ace going for them against an offense that can score runs in bunches. There is a time and place to pile on, it is right now, but they don't. Dylan Cease has to overcome his biggest fear, the fifth inning. He looks as sharp as ever when he gets James out, man. But that joke has not been made by anyone ever. Then one of the most bizarre sequences occur. First, a broadcasting error gives us a conversation that Jason Benetti has with himself. Time to get a preview of what's coming up on Subaru White Sox post game live. Chuck and Ozzy, boys, what do you got? Yeah. Ozzy. Why? So, what, you don't have like an ice machine on your freezer. Before realizing the mistake made by the 25% Jerry Reinsdorf owned network crew, he even gives advice on how to correct the mistake next time it happens. That's just for a little TV insider knowledge. That's where somebody in the truck says, kill mix minus. Then a simple pop fly just drops. Luckily, everyone has the wherewithal to let the ball roll foul. Because of this last minute recovery by Grandal, the record books will remember this play as strike two. And as long as Chris Taylor does anything short of scoring a run, this play will avoid any further infamy in highlight reels the next day. Fortunately, thanks to the sick glove work of Elvis Andrews, Taylor does not score. But the misplay caused a visibly more frustrated Cease to have to throw 11 superfluous pitches to Taylor, Betts, and Freddie Freeman. Keep this play in mind. History will forget it, but you the viewer and I will remember. So you got to the Dodgers bullpen early in the year 2023. Congratulations, that means absolutely nothing. And now you're facing Robocop Shelby Miller, but it's okay because you have your two hottest hitters coming up. This is definitely a time for the White Sox to score an insurance run, but they don't. Dylan Cease can see the finish line. Even though he did have to throw 11 extra bullets the inning before, at least it got him through the gauntlet of Betts and Freeman. But the reason he had to throw those extra bullets was due to a misplay in the infield, something that led to his unraveling against the Dodgers the year before. This time he almost snapped when he lost control of his fastball, but this time he was saved by a mound visit in which he was told to virtually ditch the heat, which got him out of the inning. Will Smith singles after seeing his third straight slider. He's able to get Jason Hayward out, but like Shyamalan, by the time Signs was released, his formula has been revealed. Sit slider, adjust to everything else, which David Peralta executes to great effect, 
ending Cease's night just short of his goal. Just like the year prior, he dominated their lineup, but an error in the fifth inning led to his eventual demise. This forces the White Sox to dip into their bullpen earlier than anticipated. After a Vargas out and an Outman single, the White Sox faced the most momentous shifting plate appearance of the night. And who else would be up but the man who dodged a slow walk back to the dugout the inning before? In baseball, we often narrow our answer of why a team won or lost a game on any given night. Most people will blame Renato Lopez for squandering the lead right here. But the truth is, this wasn't even a terrible pitch. Chris Taylor just timed his fastball perfectly and was able to get his barrel through the zone. That's just baseball, a sport where you can do everything right and still lose. Lopez just happened to give up a bloop and a blast after inheriting two runners that came as a result of the Dodgers taking advantage of a fatigued starter. A starter fatigued by having to throw an extra 11 pitches in what should have been a 1-2-3 fifth inning. An inning artificially extended when nobody wanted to take charge and catch a simple pop-up. The White Sox show some fight when a leadoff double, advance, and the Luis, we don't want you to beat us with two outs, Robert walk, summon Eloy Jimenez with a chance to give the White Sox another chance at victory when, oh, no, 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 oh, Ah, 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 So let me get this straight. The White Sox try to execute a double steal on a throw to second in a tie game. I'm going to give veteran Elvis Andrews the benefit of the doubt here and say that he was just following the instructions given to him by the third base coach. So their plan was to induce a throw to second by Will Smith, but it's a tie game. Yeah, the runner on second matters, but not as much as the game winning run. It's one thing if this happens with the ninth hitter up, or in the White Sox case, the six through two hitters, but this is Eloy Jimenez here. Yeah, he's <laughs> Eloy and not <laughs> Eloy, but he's still got a good chance to plate two with one swing. All that matters now is that the inning is over and the White Sox seem to be allergic to playing good baseball. Let's fast forward to extra innings because we'll be here all day if I had to talk about every White Sox reliever. It's the top of the 11th and the White Sox haven't scored in 9 innings. If the White Sox get a base runner and a competent hitter isn't around to drive him in, did he actually get on base? A pass ball, walk, and a walk get us here. Freddie Freeman is now up with the bases loaded and no out. Now, due to MLB's copyright system, I can't show you the end of this game. I can't even tell you exactly what happened. All I can do is share this screenshot with you. Luis Robert has every right to catch this ball, and by some karmic miracle, maybe Chris Taylor twists his ankle on the gravel of dirt where strike two of his second at-bat landed. It's unlikely, but stranger things have happened. Instead, he hangs his head in defeat. He knows the effort won't be remembered. It's that unnamed feeling for when you find comfort in losing. As if the universe gave you its toughest challenges and you lost, but you still have to show up the next day. This is life for the 2023 Chicago White Sox. When Keenan Middleton made his comments about the organizational dysfunction, what struck me weren't the comments themselves, but the organization's reaction to them. Instead of addressing their issues head on, issues even corroborated from the now traded former veteran Lance Lynn. Um, I could say this. Let me tell you, I can tell you what Key was wrong about. Okay, we're ready. Mm, I get it. GM Rick Hahn took the opportunity to throw Middleton under the bus for a seemingly innocuous incident, which even he had to admit Keenan apologized for. Hahn would be fired less than two weeks later. Players are allowed to air their team's dirty laundry if they so desire. They understand the risk they are taking in doing so. And in a market where they have such small leverage, sometimes it's the last resort they have for instituting serious change. But for an organization to slap back, even erasing his name from the big screen at US Cellular when he came back with the Yankees in August. So Keenan Middleton apparently doesn't want to be acknowledged that he's on the field by the White Sox. Is it not enough? His name's not even on the Is a level of petty that even the most pedantic of organizations wouldn't think of doing. This is at the core what the White Sox are. They are an organization devoid of the history and culture that has been built around them. A team that was able to pull together a strong farm system that mostly panned out. 
Don't believe me? Think of it like this. Even with how bad the White Sox were in 2023, they got just a little more production from players that debuted with them than the Phillies did with theirs. And just to remind you, the Phillies were a game away from reaching their second consecutive World Series. So what separates the White Sox from the Phillies then? The White Sox don't spend, period. Their largest free agent deal was Andrew Benintendi. Let me repeat, Andrew Benintendi will be the highest paid White Sox player at the end of his contract. In an ESPN article dismantling the Angels written during the 2023 season, a former player compared the Angels' reckless spending of money as taking your McLaren to a Jiffy Lube. The White Sox are a little different. They can certainly afford the McLaren, sure, but they would rather sprinkle a bit of money on a fundamentally cheap product which essentially makes them a souped up Buick Century. At the helm of all this is owner Jerry Reinsdorf, who I should also mention owns the Chicago Bulls. In an environment of toxic owners who care more about their bottom lines moving up rather than building a withstanding legacy or being an actual human being with empathy, he stands out as an especially despicable greed cow, a man who would poison the water at US Cellular if it saved him a few bucks. The same man who let Harry Carey, one of the most celebrated announcers of all time, walk over to the north side right after he bought the team in 81 because he couldn't handle a little criticism. So if you hire me, you know what you're getting. So uh, if I happen to say something about the organization that makes you unhappy, uh, they take it so personally, they're very thin skinned the White Sox people. The same man who didn't think Michael Jordan deserved to be the highest paid NBA player at the height of his powers. The same man who refused to interview anyone besides his drinking buddy for the White Sox manager position in 2021. And it's not going to get any better from here. Every issue with this team comes from the top and it goes down. What stinks the most is throughout my research of this video, I saw the passion shown by those who have to suffer the most the fans, a group who is not only highly knowledgeable, but are the most overlooked fan base when it comes to their loyalty to a franchise that has time and time again shown little recourse. A group that includes a motley of personalities such as Jay Kuda, a humble civil engineer whose silly graphs I've been using throughout this video, Sean Evans, host of Hot Ones, experimental rapper Serengeti, who appeared on the instrumental that you're listening to right now, Ben Shabibi, co-founder of The Daily Wire, Al Jorgensen, lead singer of Ministry, and at the heart of it all, we have Jason Benetti, who isn't just some plug-and-play broadcaster, but a man who has overcome so much and has done more to foster the White Sox community in his 10 years of being with the team than Jerry Reinsdorf has been able to do in a lifetime. He was one of the only bright spots while watching this fundamentally broken team play baseball, a voice that resonates throughout all the bars, homes, and communities throughout the South Side, who has helped weather this highly passionate and highly knowledgeable fan base through the storms and has Is Jerry Reinsdorf the devil? Like, seriously, White Sox fans, is Jerry Reinsdorf the devil? That is now three, you know what, make it four beloved announcers that he's fired over the years based solely on the fact that they were more liked in Chicago than he was. What struck me the most while living, breathing, and sleeping White Sox baseball over the last month was, and trust me, I did not do much sleeping, wasn't the fact that they are a cheap organization. And sure, they are. Unfortunately, a lot of other organizations are cheap. They aren't unique in that aspect. What struck me the most was the culture surrounding the team. Not the fact that, you know, it's just business, it's nothing personal, which, sure, when it came to letting Jose Abreu walk, or the fact that their highest paid free agent signed for less than $100 million in the year 2023, then, yeah, it's just because they're cheap. But when it comes to front office hirings, uh, personnel hirings, when it comes to basically building this organization, uh, the only grounds that you need to work for the White Sox is how much of a sycophant you are to Jerry Reinsdorf. His ego pretty much cannibalizes the entire organization, and it's that cognitive dissonance between it being business when it comes to free agent signings or, or letting beloved players walk. It's just you know, man, it's just business. You know, that's just the that's just the business we live in. But when it comes to front office hirings and personnel and and actually building a smart organization, it's just, hey, man, you know, if you trust me, I will take you places. I will take you straight to the top. You just got to trust me. I'm Jerry Reinsdorf. 
That, to me, is the core of why the White Sox are so fucked. And at the center of it all is Jerry fucking Reinsdorf. The sad part is, there's nothing we can do. We just have to sit and watch as, as he fires beloved announcer after beloved announcer, as he prioritizes ticketing and marketing more than he does the scouting department. And he's not going to sell the team because <laughs> I'm a boring guy. What else am I going to do? And there's just nothing, nothing you as White Sox fans or I can do about it. No, you know what? Fuck that. I'm going to use the only tool that the powerless have when they want their voice to be heard. So this is for all the White Sox fans out there. This is for Jason Benetti, for Jay Kuda, for that fan with the epic rant, and for everybody within the White Sox community. Fuck you, Jerry Reinsdorf. 